Listen, I did film and television studies at university for three years. I spent hours reading countless books and articles on subjects spanning from film all the way to television. Not a single one mentioned Hugh Grant once. I achieved the hardest qualification across any university or college ever, a 2-1 in history. Let me tell you, the only thing that I learned was that we, as a society, have a history of denying and neglecting Hugh Grant's artistic and cultural relevance, not just in this country, but in the entire world. I met Oscar at a Hugh Grant-themed event I put on at the Students' Union. It felt as though Diggory and I were the only ones there. And we agreed that there was a Hugh Grant-shaped hole in academia. We decided to put it right ourselves. We want to show people that he's an icon in acting. We want to show people he's more than just a bumbling posh guy. I'm Diggory Waite. And I'm Oscar Beardmore Gray. And, and this, this is... is... Taking Hugh for granted. Hello and welcome to Taking Hugh for Granted, the podcast in which one Hugh Grant enthusiast watch every single film starring Hugh Grant in the attempt to answer a simple question. Is this film Taking Hugh for Granted? Is this film good on its own or does it rely on the bumbling Brit for its acclaim? I'm Dewey Waite and I'm joined as always by the real Hugh Grant obsessive Oscar Beermore Grey. Oscar, how the bloody hell are you doing today, mate? I'm doing great, Diggs. That, I mean, that's the best intro of the entire series um, yes. i mean maybe straight off the bat you should explain why you've introduced me as the real hugh grant scholar yes well we've had some issues ladies and gentlemen people who listen weekly and are up to date will know we are within touching distance of completing our goal like honestly oscar i've never finished anything in my entire life i'm so excited <laughs> to have done this to be, to be able to sit back and be like we have watched like tens of hours maybe hundreds of hours of hugh grant content we could have watched every single film every single feature film by hugh grant and a load of his tv shows and stuff we are two films away from that we can't find them online so we have gone out of our way to buy the films oscar you bought a copy for you know God knows how much money. I bought a copy that had to be shipped over from the US. Unfortunately, I plugged it into my DVD player, which I had to get out the old DVD D player. Yeah, that must have been. Off. Yeah, you must have literally got that down from the attic almost. Yeah, it's lucky that I have this sort of SCART to HDMI adapter. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to even plug it into my TV. Oh, God, those things I are know. ancient. Scart leads, man. Think about that. This this is how this is how old we're going in. Scart leads. I think I think they're around in uh, Tutankhamun's team <laughs> had those. Um, and so I got this. I got the Scart lead adapter on. I plugged it in, and do you know what? I filmed it because I was so excited. Here she is. Let's do it. On him. Let's get this bad boy out. I think she's gonna work. You know. Ooh. And then you hear the like, it's like, <laughs> like rattling up the DVD player. Oh, listen to that. Fucking hell. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. And it goes, ooh, and it says on the DVD player, error. And I was like, what? And then I looked at the screen, and the screen says, basically, it's a US copy. And because I'm in the UK and I'm using a UK DVD player, I can't see this film. So, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time ever, I haven't actually watched the film <laughs> that we're discussing today. <laughs> However, I am joined by the real Hugh Grant enthusiast, Oscar Wimore Gray, who has seen the film. Am I right? You have watched it. I have watched it. And I was, I'm, I'm, I was, I was kind of thinking that, actually, as I also put the DVD, I, I, was, I watched it on my PlayStation. But I, it did come across in my mind, there are issues around mm. where, you can, where you can watch certain DVDs. And it, it does seem bonkers now in our age of hyper technology that mm. you know only 10 years ago you you had to buy a different dvd to watch it in a certain country i i assume that's for like was, was that i don't know is that something to do with the system or was that to do with sales maybe a combination of both yeah uh, it was piracy, the same with playstation I, yeah. as well wasn't it like you could you can't play a u.s playstation game in a uk playstation i think and i remember when i was a kid and we'd be on holiday whenever we'd see a dvd or a game that we wanted we'd, i'd always be like mom mom get me in get me in she'd always be like no no degree we can't get you that because it won't work on our thing at home and i was always like ah you're just saying that you knob and i thought it was this genius <laughs> tactic i was like okay that sounds maybe true and i was like that's very clever of her i was like why would they make different playstations and different things like of course it would work obviously today i've learned the hard way that she was telling the truth the whole time i remember the same kind of thing where you know you go on holiday 
and we might get into this, and I can't remember if it was to Europe or the couple of times that I went over to Canada on holiday, but I remember it being the kind of thing when you were like, back in 2005, you would mm. bring your three favorite DVDs to watch and bring them on, bring them in your suitcase. And I yeah. remember them, my, my parents being like, oh, don't, don't bother bringing them because they won't work. I've got the, the opposite of that once where I was planning to steal a dvd from a french <laughs> from a french place we were staying in france and my mum was like don't steal that and i was like oh no she's caught me she was like no no you you, you could steal it but but you it wouldn't be useless um <laughs> like so uh that's probably teaching me to get, be a better person than i was but there you go mm. yeah but we should but like talking of that and talking of france we're obviously mm, of course i think our final film we have to watch is a french film that we we mentioned this on the last pod that hugh grant speaks french and so we're very excited about that yeah man. but if we can only find a dvd copy in french from france we might have to go to france to watch their dvd or find <laughs> a fr- or find a french dvd <laughs> player or something i don't know what's going to happen we can only hope the that there's some sort of eu regulation about this and that the French DVD players and the UK DVD players were both under an EU thing, so they both mm. play each other's DVDs. Fingers crossed. If not, then we were right to leave the EU. It sucks. And uh, <laughs> and uh, actually, listeners, hive mind. If there's, if you guys can think about a workaround, how I get this DVD to work in the UK, mm. that'd be great. But maybe I should talk about the film today. <laughs> yes, the dawning. <laughs> The Dawning. Shall we have a synopsis from Synopsis Simon, who also hasn't seen the film? (laughs) Let's do it. (laughs) The Dawning, directed by Robert Knights and released in 1988. An idealistic young Nancy Gulliver, played by Rebecca Pigeon, is surprised when she discovers IRA gunman Angus Barry, played by Sir Anthony Hopkins, whilst he's on the run from the government. As they begin to get to know each other and Nancy begins to support Angus's cause, she must keep his whereabouts a secret from everyone, including the potential object of her affection, Harry, played by Hugh Grant. So, so Diggs, as we've established, you haven't actually watched the movie, which is Correct. a shame. Yeah. But from what you've read and found out and the few clips you may have seen on YouTube, what do you know about this film? Well, um, I know that Anthony Hopkins is in it, Mm. which is the main thing you see online. I think I saw a few people saying that this film is for Anthony Hopkins fans only. Well, (laughs) that ends now. (laughs) Does it (laughs) now? Exactly. We've trawled through. I know that there's a lady in it called Rebecca Pigeon, uh, which you guys (laughs) will also know because you would have just heard uh, Synopsis Simon's synopsis as well. And I know that it's about the troubles and the IRA and stuff. And I believe that uh, Anthony Hopkins is in the IRA. Is that right? Yeah, you're correct. So it's the, like the very beginning of the IRA effectively. Mm. And Anthony Hopkins is this sort of rogue old bloke who comes down to this hut Mm. by the sea that the main character, Nancy, she's this girl who lives in this like nice posh house and she's mm-hmm. Irish, but you know, she's a posh Irish girl. You know, she doesn't really sound Irish and she comes down to this spot where she thinks is like her sort of safe haven, her place where she goes to sort of chill out. And then one day she comes there and Auntie Hopkins is just in there having a smoke and reading her books and she's like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And they sort of cultivate this relationship until Anthony Hopkins pulls out a gun and is like, I'm going to have to kill people. And then she sort of freaks out. Mm. And at that point, we sort of wonder, like, this guy seems a bit shady. What What's he doing? <laughs> um, and, and, then, and then the film kind of continues and we realize that he and a bunch of others are sort of, I guess, Republicans who uh, want to kill the English army. And Mm. there's a scene where a load of English officers get shot at the horse races and Nancy gets really upset, as you might imagine. And then the English army come to her house and say, do you know this guy? Show him a photo. And she's like, no, never seen him. (gasps) And then the grandfather gives it away that she does actually know him. Mm. Um, this rather senile grandfather. Then she runs down to the hut. Go away, Nancy. Go now. One final time to tell Anthony to leave and to flee. And they come out of the hut 
and the whole army is on the beach mm. and Anthony Hopkins goes let it go then you can take me to the English army and she runs away and just as she turns around they open fire and he dies <laughs> that's basically it in a nutshell shit that's the whole film basically yeah It's interesting because I didn't think that this film would have much Hugh Grant in it at all. Mm. I got the boring bit out of the way just there. Hugh Grant is actually in this film quite a bit. No, Oscar, don't tell me that. (laughs) Don't tell me that. I was really hoping he wouldn't be in it much. He's in it like a decent amount. I'd say after Anthony Hopkins, after this this girl Nancy and mm. maybe Nancy's aunt, he is definitely the fourth man on the billing. Oh, no. god damn it. Yeah. That's so annoying. Yeah. And so what is his character? He is a, an ex-serviceman who mm. seems to be the family friend of Nancy and her family. So he's hanging around their big grand house, not quite sure why, but he sort of sees himself as like quite a a sophisticated person i think so on the outside he comes across as this like very desirable young man he's extremely good looking obviously mm, um yeah he's quite suave he he looks great by the way i'll get into that in a sec yes <laughs> but on the inside he's a bit slimy he's a bit insecure and he's clearly sort of a bit troubled to be honest mm. and nancy the main character who's meant to be like 18 but she looks like she's about 14 <laughs> oh god well, yeah she, she well, it looks like she sort of falls madly in love with hugh yeah and hugh's a bit like look look you know you're you're nice and everything but you're a bit immature and i don't yeah you're not that good looking by the way <laughs> oh, god. and she's like a bit gutted about this yeah. and as the film progresses it becomes clear that she kind of outgrows him to some degree mm. like she realizes that it's more of an infatuation and the natural love is actually put really what well, this was one really nice scene where i think she's talking to her aunt who her parents are dead so she's she's been looked after by her aunt and she's discussing how much she loves hugh and she's and the aunt says no i think you just got a crush it's not that he's not nice he's just not amazing in any way mm. nancy says but he's amazingly beautiful which we all agree <laughs> yeah yeah. But, <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah um, I'm with you there, but nancy. i think the aunt really gets it spot on that he might look the part, but underneath his good looks, he's not a very good bloke. Mm. I mean, Hugh doesn't do anything not nice, but he is just very dismissive of Nancy. And also, there's this great bit where we find out he's a virgin. Oh, really? Do you feel like that after making love? Um, I don't, I don't know. You mean you've never? Look, I refuse to answer questions like that. Really? Never, ever done it. I mean, you're so old. Nancy puts him on the spot. It's like, you're a version. You're so old, mate. (laughs) 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 And Hugh just, he looks like he's just seen a ghost. He doesn't know what to say. It's absolutely, it's it's, it's brilliant stuff. So what about his look then? You mentioned that. Is he wearing military garb or like, is he one of those guys who's like ex-military? He's like, and I'm going to keep wearing the outfits until the day I die. Like, I love it. Or is he... bit more chilled out well i wouldn't say he's chilled out but yeah. he's not he's not in the army gear he he look he, he he wears some really nice stuff at the beginning like you know proper like tweed suits Ooh. cool hats yeah very well fitted garments in general and you know he's got slick back hair you um, like this slick back hair hugh look i know you do <laughs> it's very very similar interestingly i think to his look in the remains of the day i was which, just of course, about to say that yeah well he's got the slick back hair which is of course was five years later and the other time that hugh and anthony hopkins team up but of course anthony hopkins and hugh actually don't share a scene i don't think in the entire movie interestingly right. but obviously that's two big dogs coming together in the remains of the day yeah his look is really good at the beginning of the film and i think that that's the sort of reason why nancy is falling in love with him and mm. really really can't keep her eyes off him but as the film goes on as his character sort of unwinds a bit and we discover that he's actually not a very nice person, his look sort of goes down. It's not that he doesn't look good. It's just like he looks like a bit of an old man. He starts wearing like 
And you know when like old men wear suits and they they have their suit up to like up here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, <laughs> they have just their... just below their nipples. Yeah, and yeah. they got like their tie tucked into their trousers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly. Yeah. It kind of looks like Uncle Vernon kind of rocks that look sometimes in Harry it's... Potter. Exactly, and he actually another time I feel like he rocks a similar look is as Jeremy Thorpe in A Very English Scandal. Yes, definitely. Is is actually probably the closest closest look in comparison oh, with, wow. with that um and he's got this kind of like black pinstripe suit on mm. um his trousers are way too high his tie is almost tucked into his belly <laughs> um and he's got this black hat on mm. and nancy steps off the bus and they're walking back home and and he's like where the hell have you been because she's just been with some other bloke in dublin and she, in fact actually she starts kind of courting an ira guy and so yeah. it's all a bit awkward and nancy's like you know what, Hugh, mate? Take your bloody hat off. You look like an idiot. And the, is the cheek on her. And then yes. they get home and the aunt's like, Hugh, Hugh's like in a sulk now because he's basically just been like mugged off. Yeah. And he's sitting on he's sitting on this on this bench and the aunt comes up to him and she goes, oh, Hugh, how are you? Kind of thing. And then she yeah. goes, take that dreadful hat off. <laughs> <laughs> and Hugh, Hugh looks so upset, man. It's, so he's getting uh, it up from all angles at that point. He is getting it from all angles. So, oh, no. you know, he, he starts up here and then he, yeah. and then the film, I think, on purposely brings his character down and we, we don't look at him quite in the sort of starry heights as we do at the beginning of the movie. And that's mm. reflected in his, in his look, I think. Mm. Do you think so? Because he's in a lot and stuff. Like, do you think his character is a good one? Does he have a good arc? Christ, I feel like I'm being interrogated here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I need to know. Because when people at the end of this say, oh, what do you think of The Dawning? I'll be like, uh, let me just refer to my notes and what the Oscar told me. <laughs> uh, do, do I think he had a good character arc? Um, what he had, The way he treats Nancy at the beginning of the film justifies his demise at the end of the film. Mm, yeah, I suppose actually thinking about my question, it's not for him to change. I suppose the film is about Nancy changing, isn't it? I imagine. Mm. I, I guess. <laughs> um, well, it is very much, yeah. I yeah. mean, I think the, the main thing about the film really is Nancy is sort of portrayed as this incredibly like immature mm. schoolgirl, effectively at the beginning of the film. And she kind of comes into her own... Um, throughout the film and obviously starts kind of getting into the like Republican mm. free Island movement. Mm. But the wall is sort of pulled over her eyes a little bit because she becomes infatuated by Hopkins and his, his and his role in the IRA, despite not knowing really what he does. She just knows that he's like mm. sort of hiding and, you know, for some reason can't show his face in public and doesn't want he doesn't want her to tell people that they've been meeting and stuff like that. Because what I'm getting from what you're saying is as well is like, so she she matures and she's no longer infatuated with Hugh, but then she finds, she essentially, like by the end of the film, yes, she's changed and she may have like, quote unquote, matured. However, all that's really done is her infatuation has shifted to another thing that's maybe not so great. Would you say that is the meaning of the film? <sighs> Oh, because <laughs> <laughs> because to, to be honest, I mean, maybe that's just my mind going mad, all right? I just, I'm just like taking things that you haven't that actually don't mean, and maybe the film is made. But if that is mm. what the film is, that then that sounds like quite a grown up film, basically being like, listen, she starts out a bit shit, she ends a bit shit, but the world's just a bit shit. Yeah, I guess I, I guess the film is based around these two relationships and with the mm. backdrop of of the kind of irish movement and irish politics which is a, definitely a story that mm. is sort of under told probably um at least at least within a kind of british context but whether or not it was done that effectively is another question right because I was expecting this film to be very, very bad. That was my expectation. The fact that you can't find it online anywhere. The fact that it was basically like, unless you're an anti Hopkins fan, don't bother watching this shit. Yeah. So I was pleasantly pleased by the film. I actually thought it was it was it was quite you know is it it was one of those films where it wasn't like a get out get out your seat kind of film. Mm. But you weren't falling asleep. <laughs> that's, that's probably not a great... It's a low bar. <laughs> it's a low yeah. bar. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but it sort of chugged along quite nicely. Mm. And um, I think 
Anthony Hopkins really showed himself to be a stellar actor, as we yeah. as we all know. Yeah, I think Na- the thing was that Nancy's character. This is she. It was her first ever film, so she's probably mm. like actually eighteen years old, and she was good in parts and not so good in other parts. Mm. I don't think that she carried the film mm. effectively. Mm. I mean, it, the, the film actually won a few prizes. I think it won a prize at the Cannes Film Festival. It won a prize at the Montreal F- Film Festival. Mm. So, you know, it's definitely not a, it's not a bad film. I mean, I think there are reasons why it's not considered one of, say, Anthony Hopkins or Hugh Grant's best films. Which, exactly, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I think you're spot on. The fact that it's not online clearly means that not the right people didn't love it. Because uh, it's not it's not that old. We found stuff that's older than 1988 that we've been able to watch, such as a couple mm. of weeks ago when we watched uh, Honor, Profit and Pleasure. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was that was the worst like taping of it ever. But like it was something where it just feels like this one, even though it has two huge actors and Rebecca Pigeon, um, <laughs> <laughs> like it, it, it's still no one's taken the time to like hunt it out and put it up online. By the way, I got a bit of blowback uh, from my mother about on a profit, on getting, a profit and pleasure and about getting a uh, handle wrong. Got, yeah, apparently I got some of the eras wrong. So oh, I, I, no. uh, I apologise to you as I was mercilessly taking the piss out of you <laughs> and actually I was getting everything wrong. So you're vindicated. Oh, thank goodness. I, to be fair, I spoke to my dad about it as well and because he loves opera, as I say, as you know, he takes people on tours around Handel's house. So when I was like, so was Handel, did he do opera? He just looked at me and was like, Diggory, come on. Come on. You're my son, for God's sake. Don't do this to me. I know you don't know much, but you've got to know this. Jesus. Um, so so t- I think we both come away from that episode getting a scolding from our parents, yeah. which is quite right. What is love? Actually. You know what, Patrick Flynn? What, Beth Amon? I think we need to do a second season of our amazingly wonderful podcast, What is Love Actually? Are you saying we should dip into the almost endless and bottomless trove of Christmas films from Hallmark Life? time and netflix choose six and then take them apart one at a time starting november 26th yes i am all right then what is love actually season two coming november 26th subscribe on apple podcasts or wherever you download go to patreon.com slash love actually pod for a list of season two's films as well as bonus episodes video podcasts movie commentaries and more Diggs, any other questions on this film i feel like my voice is going hoarse from <laughs> trying to yeah. recall. I feel like I'm like back in back in university, like as a film and TV student, trying to yeah. analyze and defend a film that I only saw for two hours yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once actually at uni when we went to go and see the university paid for us all to go and see the same film to make sure that we watched it. They paid mm. for us all to go and see the, uh, the film. It was called Inherent Vice. Uh, mm. He starred like Joaquin Phoenix and a few people. I remember Not Joaquin Phoenix. Man. I know that guy who he's we on hate our, on this he's podcast. On our, he's, he's on our, our naughty list. He's on our shit list. So, so they paid for us all to go and see this film. I did go to the cinema, but I remember you know it was university. We'd probably been out the night before. I was so hungover. So I genuinely <laughs> just I just slept through the film in the cinema, <laughs> which is so bad. And I remember sitting there in our seminar and our seminar leader being to me like, "Oh, what did you what did you think of the film?" And I was, I don't know what came over me. I just sort of was like, listen, I fell asleep during it. Um, I didn't <laughs> see it. And, they, and this is what a bullshit course I had. He leaned forward and just went, Diggory, the film really, you're, you're absolutely right. The film did have this sort of dreamy quality. So I, 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 and, and so I can understand why you fell asleep. What, what, at what point exactly did you? Because I think that would be really interesting to discuss. That is the sort of course I was doing. Like, I thought I was going to get a bollocking. And instead and they were like, and when you said during the trailers, what did this? <laughs> he was like, oh, "Okay, interesting." Well, we got yeah during the trailers. I love that. No, yeah. So uh, that was the kind of course I did. And if only they could see me now with our hit film podcast. You got to go be one of those annoying lum- alumni who give a yeah. give a sort of degree weight graduate of the two thousand and seventeen class. Is yeah. back to talk Hugh Grant. Yeah, exactly. It's back to talk to guys. In, like work hard because if you do you can have a Hugh Grant podcast as well <laughs> taking he for granted taking he for granted taking he for granted what did you think lads were they taking he for granted right Oscar The Dawning 1988 mm. big hitting names in this film Anthony Hopkins Indeed. Hugh Grant Rebecca Pigeon 
That is her name, isn't it? I just love that name. I can't stop saying it. Um, <laughs> Rebecca Pigeon. And, and actually, we, we didn't discuss one person. Uh, Jean, 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 Jean who? Jean, <laughs> I was just, sorry, Jean's, you, okay, oh, wait, maybe. Jean oh, Simmons? Okay. Jean, Jean Simmons? Is it Jean, Jean Simmons? Jean Simmons. Jean Simmons, Simmons is, she, Yo, she's famous. Fuck? Yes, yeah, I, I, th- I was thinking Jean Simmons from the band Kiss. Which one's Gene Simmons? Am I right in thinking Gene? I don't know. Gene Simmons, in any way, is in this film. Is she? She? Oh, yeah. I don't. To be fair, I don't know who she is. But but she's she a... w- she was a famous big time actress who won Academy Awards, and hey. she was in this movie. And she came out of retirement just to be in this movie. Really? Yeah. But she hadn't the... film. She hadn't starred in a film for ten years, and then she came and did this. I've just looked her up, and she's buried in Highgate Cemetery, which is where my dad takes people on <laughs> tours. And how mad is that? It all, Spooky. It all comes together. That's crazy. And I am right, though. Gene Simmons, the singer of Kiss, is also called Gene Simmons. That's why I was like, hang on, this is a weird film. Like, it, you, you mean the singer of Kiss is in there? The guy with the long tongue who spits out blood and he plays the guitar. Uh, no, that is very fair. Again, do you reckon your, your mum is going to be like... Oscar, how did you not know who Gene Simmons was? I don't think she's going to. She's not as keyed up on, on movies as she is on music. So I think I'll get away with it. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Well, speaking of get away, getting away with things, does this film get away with it? Is this film taking you for granted? I don't think this film is taking you for granted. I'm happy to say. <sighs> I'm very happy to say. I think the reason why I don't think it's taking you for granted is because such low expectations, as I mm. said before, and Hugh exceeded the expectations in this film. He Not only is he actually a relatively major part, mm. he actually does a really, really good job in this film. And he looks great. He acts great. He's got a lot of lines. He sort of plays like this villain and his character changes and his character is quite nuanced. Mm. And so for that reason, I'm very happy to say that he is going on the right side of nice. our chart, which needs updating. Yeah. And... He is not being taken you for granted in the dawning. That's class, mate. <sighs> I mean, do you want do you want to make a make a statement or <laughs> uh, listen? I well, my statement is I want to apologize to all the taking you for granted fans out there who are listening to this. And they they're like, what have you done for the last half an hour? <laughs> you guys, <laughs> what have you done, Dougie? You should be ashamed of yourself. I will I will do my best to watch this film. And as soon as I have, I will give uh, my update on it maybe when we do our massive retrospective on all the films by that point mm. hopefully I'll be, I'll be able to give some more detailed thoughts on it i have one more so is this quite a grown-up film would you say as well uh, well you're not going to put it on for the kids yeah yeah it's like <laughs> come on kids, fall, this the, like the they all fall asleep it's not particularly violent it's yeah. not it, it it's probably you know it's probably a pg but one of those kind of period pieces that Unless you understand the context, you don't really have any clue what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, there's no nudity. There's n- there's no there's no sex. Yeah. There's no there's not much violence. Like a few people get shot, but it's not really like yeah. graphic. It's not like Squid Game. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. God, that is horrible. Uh, that is so violent. It's ridiculous. I got. I'm watching the last episode tonight, so no, no Ooh, spoilers. No please. spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> um. You know, it's quite PG, but mm. you're not putting it on for the kids. So I would say it's it's got a level of sophistication that you expect mm. a Hugh Grant of films course. to be like. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, if when you tell it, sell it like that, though, I'm like, oh bloody hell, this film is taking you for granted. No sex, <laughs> no no gratuitous <laughs> violence. I'm fuming, but no, you're. I have I have no skin in this game. I have no squid in this game. I mm-hmm. I'm gonna to have to go along with what you say, and this film is not taking you for granted. But that makes me feel so much worse because I haven't seen it. A film that hasn't been taking you for granted, and I haven't bloody seen it. This is making me so sad inside. Uh, I know, Diggs. We'll, uh, uh, we're gonna to have to work, uh, find a workaround, but I will I will get hard at work on that. Whilst we're looking at what the hell we're gonna do about Travaux, this French film, mm. which it, it, we have to see Hugh Grant in a French <laughs> film speaking French. That is, I can't believe what's that first. I mean, that is, I it, yeah, it's top on the list. We're gonna find a way, Diggs. We'll find a way. Uh, we're not gonna we'll disappoint. We're not gonna we're not gonna disappoint the fans, and it no. will be our last ever Hugh Grant film. Yeah, that's not to say that it's gonna be our last episode because we no. got 
got plenty of content coming down the line. Christmas is around the corner. Yeah. We love our Christmas we episode. Love our Christmas that episodes. It's become a, our third Christmas episode is going to be. Yeah. It's epic. Epic it's stuff. The epic stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've got Christmas coming around the corner. We've got maybe another best of. We've got all sorts of things we can do. We've got this epic retrospective where we look back at all the films. And then to be fair, early next year, Hugh Grant will have a new film out. I believe end of Jan, he'll have this film out with that guy, Guy Ritchie. So I'm sure we'll have to talk about that as well. But we will make sure. Before that film comes out, we will have watched every feature-length Hugh Grant film. That's our promise. Let's do it. That's yeah. our promise. Right, lads and ladies, we promise we'll see you in a couple of weeks for another episode of Taking You For Granted. Until then, be safe. We love you very much. Hey. Bye. Taking Hugh For Granted is produced, edited and presented by Diggory Waite and Oscar Beardmore Gray. The producers of Taking Hugh For Granted would like to state that this podcast is in no way associated with the actor Hugh John Mungo Grant, nor does it endorse his views or represent him in any way. Instead, by creating this podcast, Oscar and Diggory hope to celebrate Hugh's illustrious career, reliving his old classics and shedding light on some of his hidden gems. Hugh. If you're listening, we hope you approve.